And welcome back to Nostalgia Cast. I'm Darren Lemberg. And I'm Johnny Craddock. And today we'll be discussing the Tim McCanley's directed Secondhand Lions from 2003. Sorry, Michael Caine, Robert Duvall, and Haley Joel Osment. You will be discussing it. I oh, won't be <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> because you're... Uh, yeah, we, we, we've we been talking about you making the move to Texas, right? But uh, mm-hmm. obviously, we're recording this a little bit after the fact because uh, you weren't able to record the night that uh, that mm-hmm. I sat down with Dallin. So this is a little bit uh, afterwards. So I already know how our conversation went. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, being a weird timer. Anyway, that's what we'll be discussing on this episode, uh, minus, sadly, minus you. It would have been, it would have been fun having you part of that conversation. But yeah. before we move on to that, let's go ahead and talk uh, Night Shift from last time. We had uh, Jeanette uh, yeah. Mickenham. Yep. Came on and chatted about that with Henry Winkler and Michael Keaton, Shelley Long, Ron Howard directed. How uh, how did how did you feel about Night Shift? How do you feel we came down on that one? Well, I think we all uh, liked it. We all thought it was worth remembering. And I think the reason being is because Michael Keaton was so good in it, and he was the one that, for me anyway, he's the one that made the movie. Um, I know I had some issues with uh, Henry Winkler. He was still good, but he just didn't draw me in like I wanted him to. And um, what's her name? Shelley Long. Um, yeah, she's just she's just the cheers lady. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, right. So um, Jeanette, obviously, she had fond feelings of it. She talked, you know, in depth about the screenplay, which I agree with. It it did hit the, the requisite beats. It did do what it needed to do. And I think, yeah, we did come in down in agreement. We all thought that it was worth remembering. But, you know, a, a lot of that was for Michael Keaton and just the, you know, the energy and the personality that he brought to it. Also, I don't... I'm not, like you mentioned in the past, I'm not the biggest Ron Howard um, defender. I think he's fine. But, you know, for a Ron Howard movie, especially in his earlier days, I thought that he handled it very well. And it was had a personality that a lot of these 80s comedies don't have. So anyway, that was Night Shift. We had a great time with Jeanette. I'm, I'm so glad she was able to join us and have that discussion. And hopefully we'll have her on in the future. She says that she wouldn't mind coming back on, but you know, (laughs) she might just, she might just try to be nice to us. You know, we could (laughs) have, she could have really had a bad time. We would never know because she's a great actress anyway. (laughs) So (laughs) this movie, I did watch it, but um, this movie, I was never really that fond of it. So when I did see it, it was kind of forgettable for me in a way. Yeah. So um, I do have some opinions about it, but you know, we can talk about that a little later if you want. But, um, I mean, yeah, so I, I didn't mind missing that conversation. Okay. All right. That's fine. Again, it was, you know, we'll go ahead and we'll cut to that now. But before we do, let's go ahead and uh, watch the trailer. Take him to the orphanage right this minute. Whether we take him to the orphanage or tie him up and throw him in the lake, it's our business, not yours. For Walter, spending the summer with his uncles was the last place he wanted to be. Gentlemen, do you worry about the future? The Mississippi Mutual Insurance Company... was stuck in the middle of nowhere you sleep up there we don't know nothing about kids if we kick off in the middle of the night you're on your own with two crazy old men there he is and nothing to do is it okay if i go inside and watch television ain't got one no television hey no tv But sometimes you can find adventure in the most unlikely places. They say these two old men got millions stashed away. Nobody knows where they got it. They stole millions of pounds. They're bank robbers from the 20s and 30s. You two disappeared for 40 years. Where were you? You know what I don't like about house guests? Dinner table chit-chat, chit-chat. Cinema presents. Who do you think you are, huh? I'm the I fought in two world wars and killed many men and loved only one woman. Why aren't you helping him? Love always holds the bad guys. Michael Kane. This is the best idea you ever had. You bought a used line? It's defective. Can I keep him? Robert Duvall. Those stories are true, aren't they? Sometimes the things that may or may not be true are the things that a man needs to believe in the most. Joel Osment. If I'm going to live here, there's going to be some conditions. Conditions? No more dangerous stuff. No fighting teenagers, no airplanes, more vegetables. Make a live to be a hundred. You live to be a hundred. Less meat. All right. Good barbecue. You expect us to die of old age? Secondhand Lions. Tim 
Okay, so Secondhand Lions, 2003, directed by Tim McCanley, starring Michael Caine, Robert Duvall, Haley Joel Osment. Uh, again, wanted to re- uh, welcome our next special guest, uh, Dallin, otherwise known as Dallin the Film Fanatic on Twitter. How, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I am 18, almost 19. Okay, so that was something that I wanted to talk about. Again, usually Johnny and I pick uh, pick movies from the 80s because that's when we grew up. And then when I asked you what movies you wanted to pick, I think you had uh, Ghost Protocol. Uh, Mission Impossible was one. You also had Secondhand Lions. Um, and there was a third one I forget. Do you remember like the third title that you came up with? I brought up was uh, John Favreau's Zathura 5. Okay, yeah, and that basically was like, well, this this uh, this guy's probably on on the younger side, younger than us, anyway. Um, but the thing that's impressed me, especially, I think the past, what was it, in the past few weeks, we had a, a, a talk about uh, Amazing Spider Man two, and you tweeted something about like time and how the movie dealt with, uh, uh, you know, how Peter Parker tries to stop time to be able to, you know, save the people he loves, things like that, um, which was interesting because. Um, a deep dive like that, you don't usually expect it. Well, for most people on Twitter, but again, if you say that you're 18 or 19, that's, that's a pretty deep dive. Um, and, uh, or yeah, that's pretty deep thoughts on that. I just thought that was impressive. Um, so again, you don't really encounter that kind of, um, uh, discourse with a lot of people, even older people on Twitter, like I said. So if I, you don't mind me asking I me mean, what, um, you talk on your website, it, it's down the, the film fanatic.com about, you have like an immeasurable love for film. Uh, you have a passion for it. Where did that passion come from? How, how did you fall in love with movies in the first place? Well, I've been a fan of movies pretty much since day one. Um, I've grown up with a lot of films and uh, because of my uh, unique uh, experiences growing up that, I don't want to get too far into movies was pretty much an outlet for my imagination to run wild and run free with. Um, I grew up on a lot of Disney and Pixar films. And so that kind of led me to uh, get more into film. I think it wasn't until much later that I started looking at film from a more analytical point of view. I thought I wanted to express my viewpoints on films um, from, from my perspective. Uh, and I wasn't sure how to do that for the longest time, but then I started to take more and more writing English classes in school. And so I came up with a, that years now, actually, I started about May 2016. I went to see the Captain America Civil War movie, and that was the first review that I published. Um, and that ever since then, I, that's got me going on, a, on writing more about film and trying to be more critical. Because before everything was either the worst thing ever or the best thing ever. There was pretty much no in between. There was no analysis there. And I wanted to challenge myself to think more about the films that I consumed on a regular basis, um, how those films impacted me one way or the other. Um, and I've been pretty much doing that for the last five years now. I've, I'm currently in school now studying film. And now I'm starting to know what it means to become a filmmaker. Um, uh, I'm, that's which is my goal in my life and life to uh, become a screenwriter. I want to be able to write my own stories and be able to hopefully direct in the future. But the uh, screenwriting is pretty much my base goal right now. Uh, I recently finished up my freshman year of college. Okay. So what, um, yeah, that's, wow. Again, you, you seem to be off to a pretty good start there. A lot of people, like, again, they don't really get into the analytical side, maybe until their 20s or a little bit later. So that's that's fairly impressive. So what, um, uh, you know, we talked about what got you in the film. What what would you say, um, what would you say are the movies that kind of define you? Like, what 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 what's your viewpoint as far as, like, what, what movies would best, like, if people want to get to know Dallin, like, what were, what are the movies that you would pick, like, three movies you pick that would best describe your personality, your your likes, and and what you like to see in film? Well, this could be just a uh, childhood bias, but I think one of the films that comes to mind is uh, Finding Nemo. That's probably one of, it's not my favorite film of all time. Um, I watched that from a very early age, um, and that was pretty much the film that made me love film. Um, and just the, the way that the film, and we'll talk about it in this podcast with Second Man Lions, but the way that that film appeals to both adults and kids by 
not necessarily trying to play to either or audiences and just try and tell a story that is universal and can be enjoyed by all. Another one that's uh, uh, 2010 10, 10 Tron Legacy, um, which is that I have on my, uh, my blog film, but that connected to me on a personal level, teaching me about um, more about myself and, and specifically more about perfection and imperfection and how we tend to think about perfection, uh, perfection as the ultimate goal to aspire towards and how I've been trying to teach us, uh, teach people that, uh, no, our imperfections are in a way what make us perfect. It changed my whole outlook on life and about how we can strive for perfection by using our flaws to make us, help us achieve our goals. Um, and I guess another one would be Lord of the Rings, uh, not a specific one, but uh, the, the trilogy overall. I know that's a touchstone for many people, but what I enjoyed most about those movies is that, that it was able to, to tell a grand, broad, story, broad style of storytelling on, on such a great level um, that you rarely see nowadays. Um, trying to tell a, a widespread story with so many moving parts and so many characters that as someone who's trying to go into screenwriting and trying to study like how to make something that uh, can include so many elements, uh, you know, I watch those films now and I think, my gosh, I can't imagine what must have gone into making these movies now that I'm learning just what it is to make a small, low budget, even Z budget film, um, to be working with on that high level with that much budget behind you telling a series of books that have been beloved for generations. Um, the accomplishment in, and the ability to make something that is respectful of source material while also being something completely on its own that can exist independent of, it, of, the, of the, the novels um, is something that really connected to me uh, at a young age. And uh, maybe it's also because of some personal experiences I had traveling abroad and uh, visiting New Zealand, seeing a few of the locations that they filmed those movies in also made it much more personal to me um, and helped me along that um, train. So I guess it would be those three properties that um, inspired me to make movies one day. Okay. Yeah. And when, uh, when did you go to New Zealand? When did that happen? Um, that was around when they were making Hobbit movies. In fact, they had recently renovated the um, Hobbiton site. And so we were the, um, the Shire set with all the Hobbit holes. Um, that was the, that was the most notable experience and just being there and seeing the, the impact that those movies had, even at a young age, I was think, I think it was like nine years old at the time. Even then it was like, wow, this is, this really means something, you know, I, I wonder what about film can make, can attach to someone that would make something so that would make a film so meaningful to someone. Um, and not only to someone, but whole, um, whole island of people. Um, and that was, that idea is, something I've taken uh, further on in life and trying to make something that, you know, I think about it from a personal level, but I, I rarely think about ways in which things that I write or produce can impact others. But um, that was something that also affected me personally. Okay. And it's good, I guess, you know, being able to see, you know, the filming locations put that kind of puts everything in perspective. It sounds like. Yeah, it does. It really does. Okay. Um, well, the other thing I wanted to bring up too, is, you know, you're writing, obviously you've got your blog, but you've also been able to contribute to ldsliving.com. Um, how did, how did you come about doing that? Is it just, did they ask you or how did you end up getting things published for their site? Well, once I started writing movie reviews, I, I uh, had some people reach out to me, friends of friends, people that I've known from different places around the world. And once I started hearing from them, they were like, hey, these are opportunities that you can do. Um, would you be interested in doing something like that? I got invited to um, do different things. And so when they when they told me that was something you could do, I was like, yeah, I wanted, I want to do something like that. And that they were able to uh, accommodate my uh, 
specific writing schedule, uh, writing style, which is different from how they normally produce these things. Um, I'm very thankful to them and for the opportunity that was um, to write something like that uh, on such a wide audience scale. Something, you know, I usually work with just this small blog that really, you know, gained, gained some attraction, uh, you know, same, some readers, but it's nothing like, nothing huge. But uh, the opportunity to write something for a bigger audience and see how that affected how I wrote. When I started, it was pretty much you know, that's, oh my gosh, I love this thing. This is the greatest thing ever. Um, that was one of the events that really shifted it to the point where I was being more critical and more analytical. And um, one of the last, that last, you know, not maybe not last, but one of the, you know, one of those stages where it was like, okay, do, okay, I, I'm more interested in learning about making movies now than, than simply writing about movies. It was one of those experiences like, hey, maybe, maybe just writing about movies is enough. You got something here that where, where you can think about things and think about storytelling on a much larger level than just how a filmmaker does it. You should try doing it yourself. And so that's, that's now my goal. That's become now my goal. So that was one of those opportunities that really changed things for me. Okay. Yeah. That's, not all of us get those kind of opportunities. So it's good that you're kind of latching onto those and, and, and taking advantage of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, um, like we talked about, you know, some, we mostly talk eighties movies, um, but secondhand lines, I think uh, maybe with mission impossible, it was more trying to push you in a direction that I had never seen secondhand lions. <laughs> so it, 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 I've always been looking for an excuse to watch that movie. And you mentioning it was like, well, this would be a great opportunity. And, it, you know, it's kind of a selfish way because I think a lot of people like ghost protocol is pretty fresh in a lot of people's minds. Uh, Tron legacy is pretty fresh in people's minds, but secondhand lions, which is again, is about memories. It's about, um, you know, truths and, and uh, taking stories and, and uh, accepting them as, as truth, that kind of thing. So I thought that was uh, tied into our podcast fairly well. But what, um, what is it about Secondhand Lions? What is your connection to the movie? And what, when was your first time watching it? And what, is it, what did it mean to you back then when you first saw it? So the funny thing about this film was that I watched it in a similar experience to how the character Walter, you know, goes to his great uncles to visit. I was visiting my grandparents at the time. I think it was for a holiday season. And they, you know, they're fun people to hang out with. And so they introduce you to a lot of things. And one of them, you know, we watched old Disney movies from the 50s together, you know, like the Boatniks and Blackbeard Ghost and North Avenue regulars together, those kind of old, old classic Disney films. Um, but one of them was Secondhand Lions. And I think, I, don't know, I, I was at that age where I was like, not my taste in film were very specific. I wasn't yet at the point where I was like, considering anything outside my own interest. I wasn't at the point where I was broadening my horizons much. Um, which is funny now, because now I look at this film and it's like, no, this isn't broadening your horizons much. Not com to compare that from where I was to where I'm at now. and what kind of films to seek out to watch and to expand my taste. Yeah, I guess back then we watched it and it was one of those things where this is something that I, I enjoy on a deeper level too. You know, this is, it was one of those things that was like, not only is this a film that I enjoy, but I enjoy it for specific purposes. And, you know, that was, I had wanted to write about film much later in life. You know, that was a few years away, but it was one of those times where it was like, hey, here's a film that I enjoy. Why do I enjoy it? You know, what things about it um, connect with me personally. I think it was very much the idea of watching a film that felt like it was about you, about your experience, like about things that you're interested in, adventure, adventure, you know, comedy, hanging out with relatives, not only that, but talking about morals and ethics on a much deeper level than you see most family films nowadays talk about. And the way that this film does it um, has been one of my br blueprints for like, hey, this is how this film approaches it. Maybe think about it this way or think about it in a way that's unique to you. Um, as you get older, you start to realize just what it is about film that you enjoy. And so as I, as I thought back on this movie, I haven't watched this in a while. So that was one of those. So this was 
a, a good choice for this podcast. As I recall you saying that you want to talk about films that you haven't seen in a while that you're, you're wanting to revisit. Um, so while I, while, it's, while I do consider it something that uh, heavily inspired me growing up, I haven't watched in a while, um, jarring to say the least, like, wow, you're really thinking about this differently and you've really changed a lot from where you were when this first came into your life. You know, I, you know, I get that, I guess that's a bit hokey, but then again, this movie is very schmaltzy as well. I'm sure we'll get into it. So I'm kind of it. Yeah. That's one of the things that I had. One of the first notes um, that I had r- watching the movie was that it's easy to empathize with staying at a strange relative, strange house for the first time. I think that's something that all of us kind of grow up with. Um, but you know, talking about my experience with the movie too, I mentioned that I hadn't seen it. I, it's one of those movies that was on my radar because I've always liked Robert Duvall and Michael Caine and Haley Joel Osment. And so, and especially Tim McCanley's, I know he wrote the screenplay for the Iron Giant. Um, so that was a good connection there. But like, I remember when it came out on DVD, I bought a copy of it because I planned on watching it, but I never got around to it. And then years passed and I still hadn't seen it. And so I ended up selling uh, the DVDs uh, to somebody else. And so just recently I had to, I've been streaming movies, obviously, but I decided maybe to reach out to a neighborhood and ask if anybody else has uh, secondhand lions in the neighborhood and a, a family, the Santos family, uh, Elaine Santos, who lives nearby. She said, Oh, you know, we have the movie, you can borrow it. That's a strange experience trying to go speaking of going over to, to strangers houses, but going over to somebody's house that you'd never met before and borrowing a DVD from them. I think that's like, um, you know, that's also something that you kind of, um, are nostalgic for just being able to share things, uh, not just stories, but share things between like neighbors and things like that. I thought that was an interesting experience. So obviously I wanted to thank the Santos family for letting me borrow their copy of secondhand lions, but having never seen the movie before, I agree with you, um, watching it this time, it seemed like it was made, obviously, like you said, it's set in the sixties, but it does seem like it was made in the eighties. It has a filmmaking quality to it. That's a little more um, less spectacular. I guess you could say it's, it's uh, more like a daisical and just kind of matter of fact, even the fantasy sequences aren't as um, you know, we talk about comparatively movies that are about whimsy um, that are about stories like big fish. Tim Burton's big fish has a lot of uh, commonalities between it, with this movie and that it's, a character spinning tall tales and we kind of see the, the, um, you know, the stories play out in a fantasy setting. Princess Bride does that a lot too, where it's the kid like imagining his, his grandfather telling him the story, even Forrest Gump, which has a young Haley Joel Osmond in it that has the same quality of Forrest Gump telling strangers about his life. And when you watch it, like, is that, exactly how it happened or is it just how the person listening imagines it or is it we're seeing things from the perspective of the storyteller i just thought that was interesting what uh did you see any kind of parallels with that and how or think of any other movies that it kind of ties in with i thought the the indiana jones last crusade which late sequences especially the ones in the desert um it reminded me a lot of that kind of style of getting down dirty in the sand and desert and trying to make things look real and it's not portrayed very spectacularly it's very down and dirty you know, the camera is not doing these grand epic shots all over the place it's very much in the moment trying to capture the the feelings that they have filming for wants you to feel and not trying to do it in a way that seems superficial or in a way that seems disingenuous to what the intent is um i also noticed how the film tries to make things more real, even outside the fantasy sequences. A lot of films these days, you know, you see a lot of, um, they, they try and do things that way, but it always is, they're, they're always do things, um, go the easy way with them, to try to make it seem real without it actually being real. Um, that was the main thing that I noticed throughout that much like the film's themes about what is real, what is true, honesty, integrity, and things like that, felt like that approach was very much taken to heart when actually making the film, um, trying to make things as honest and as real as possible without trying to apply this flashy, you know, ultra glossy aesthetic to things. 
Yeah, I thought it was interesting, like even reading like the reviews of the movie, you know, whims whimsy is hard to do because it can it either works for you or it doesn't. And it's I think the movie has like maybe a 60 percent. I don't really concentrate too much on the Rotten Tomato scores, but some of the critics that I read, they they had a problem believing in like in the stories, which I thought was funny because, again, when Hub is tell, talking to Walter and he's like, it's not about whether the stories are true. It's about like what you believe and, and how you perceive things. And it's just funny watching critics like either miss that point or maybe taking it too too uh, too much to heart. But I, I, it's it's interesting. Another one of the notes I wrote down, like I said, is is this? Are we supposed to buy what we're seeing, like in the the uh, Near East sequences or the sword fighting sequences or the scenes with the Sheik? Are we supposed to buy that as reality or are we supposed to buy it as like a fanciful kind of reality? I mean, where, where did you fall on the fence of, cause I know in the end, you know, the, the sheik's grandson comes in and then it's the thing that the little boys is, you mean they really lived and, and old Walter says, or, you know, Josh Lucas playing him says, yes, they really lived. You know, are we, do you think we're to buy um, uh, Garth's stories as being truth or is they like a facet of truth? What do you think? Um, they kind of go halfway with kind of like the, you know, probably on a much broader uh, scale, but the way Inception, that film closes out its ending very uh, anonymously, you know, you don't quite know what the ending means for its character. Um, here, it, it's a bit of the same thing where it's like, you, you don't know, yeah, they lived, yeah, they were real, yeah, the Sheik was real. Um, but you still don't know about the adventures and whether or not you know, the Jasmine character was real at all. Uh, but you believe it. You believe it because A, Hud believes, believes in it so well. And, and B, you did have the Sheik in there. So you kind of make connections in there. But what the film does to try and keep it from being um, definitive is that it often changes uh, of the so, you know, you have Garth telling the story to the story to Walter and when, you know, part of the story to doing its part and just doing the sword fighting, you know, wait a minute, you got tons of bags of gold to your back and you're still sword fighting these people. Uh, yeah. And he, he, and he comes out saying, yeah, the hub my head that felt out to you or something like that. I forget what the exact line is. But um, something like that, I think, does a lot in making you feel like mm, maybe these aren't true at all, or, or maybe they are. I'm leaning towards the side of it is true, that the stories are real, um, but maybe not in the way that they're told to us. Maybe they do change some things. I think broad strokes, it is real, but maybe the details have been changed to make it more appealing to a 14-year-old. Yeah, I can yeah, it does. Like, I guess that's interesting. Like thinking about that is, I don't know if I buy a hundred percent into everything. I don't think we're meant to, but like, obviously the Sheik was real, but like say Princess Jasmine is, it, did it happen like that? Were they, you know, was, was that the exact situation or are they just kind trying to pretty it up? Like over time, things get embellished and things become more fairy tale. So uh, I think it's the basic you know, again, when Hub's trying to talk to Walter, I think it's more like there's there's a basic truth to what's being told, even if everything isn't 100% truth. So I buy absolutely when Walter finally asks Hub, like, what happened to Jasmine? And Hub is able to tell him, you know, she died in childbirth. You know, I absolutely buy that as something that happened. But as far as them like outrunning assassins and things like that, I don't know if like that's necessarily something that we, we buy as a hundred percent truth. It's more of, you know, again, it's just them spinning tails and over time it just becomes that to, to be more interesting. What, um, what did you think? Like uh, you, we talked a little bit about how it's more down and dirty um, as, as far as compared to say princess bride or say Forrest Gump or big fish, how do you think the fantasy sequences, uh, especially the way that McCamley's directed them, how do you think the fantasy sequences stood up to those other movies? Well, I think it's, uh, it's kind of a hybrid between them because, um, what I think Rob Weiner and Tim Burton and all those directors to, uh, uh, made those films before. I think they, and you have 
Tim Burton, who's very much known for his gothic style. And Big Fish is probably one of his least gothic films, but there's still that that Burton-y, if, that, if I can say that, the Burton-y kind of look to it where things are a bit uh, discombobulated, maybe a bit eccentric uh, in the Tim Burton way that he does it. I think Rob Liner approaches it from a very simplistic point of view where it's like, it's not flashy at all, um, the, uh, the effects at least. What You don't see a lot of big wide shots of battles or, or things like what this film has. So I think it kind of goes halfway. It does it, it does it to keep it enough to make it seem bigger than it is, but it very much keeps true to its small scale approach. It doesn't have extensive sequences of battles playing out. They're either intercut with seen on specific details of the story, or they're cut together to try and move the film along. Um, I think the way that they're presented, the way that McKinley's, and I'm not familiar with his other films, but I think this is the only one I've seen, at least that he's directed. I know he's made some other films that uh, have a similar approach, but uh, I think the way that he does this is trying to make small things appear big. Um, when you're watching the scenes in Texas and certain shots of, you know, like Walter running away from home to go use the phone or, um, I, I can't think of some other ones right now that come to mind, but he tries to apply this wider scope to small scale locations. You know, he could focus on just the house and Walter running away, but no, he, he goes out further and does this wide shot with him running down the pathway, focusing on the big sky and location farmland around him. Um, and I think that is part of the theme too, of making small things appear more meaningful. Um, and maybe that connects to whether or not these stories are true or not. Um, I think the way that I perceive it at least, the, that approach does make me buy things, that the idea that things are a bit more ambiguous, um, which, um, because there is that altering of perspective, uh, not only from the character's perspective, but from the director's perspective and how he tells things. Now he focuses on these events. In fact, the Texas sequences are probably more, um, films more flashier than some of the sequences in the, the fantasy moments, um, which is, is kind of an interesting choice there. But uh, I think that does a lot to also tell that, you know, truth and what's real is what matters most. It doesn't matter all this fantasy stuff, all these stories that we're telling you, yes, they matter to us, but they don't, they don't matter in the sense of what we're trying to teach you. We're trying to teach you to make, look at things differently. And I think that approach, the way that, that they film the sequences in Texas um, works out in spades for the film. That's one of the things that I love about it so much, at least from this recent viewing. See, there's, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Your analytical mind is, that's something that I didn't really think about, especially when you see the shot of Walter running away and it's it's expansive and you can see the clouds and it's a wide shot, you can see everything. I, that's something that I, that's there. And it just didn't, it didn't hit me in that particular way that, that you talked about. Again, it's, it's that kind of um, analytics and that kind of deep dive into things that I really appreciate about you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, going back to your particular point about, you know, you don't really see big epic battles or, or things like that. I think it's interesting because when you think about Princess Bride, the grandson, how he's imagining the fantasy sequences, they are very close quarters and there's nothing really like, that doesn't, the camera never really stands back and gives you a wide shot a lot of the time because if you're a 10 or an 11 year old boy and you're being told these stories by your grandpa and he's just talking about two characters, all you see is the two characters and they're right there in like your, your mind's eye. And so I, I do think that's interesting. Again, that's something that I never would have uh, pieced together if, if you hadn't just said that. I think the only, the main difference between something like this and, you know, Forrest Gump is a lot more on the technical side uh, being impressive. And this is more of a low budget kind of approach. But if you were to compare this to Princess Bride, I think, what really sells the fantasy sequences for me in Princess Bride is the William Goldman writing. 
just the um and the acting even i think just the the wit and the way that the actors are performing the wit and the way they're they're all in that really sells the the fantasy for me i think there's a disconnect a little bit in this movie when you see a young hud and a young garth and you don't really have that same connection with those actors as you would with michael kane and robert duvall and again i don't know if the like the writing in particular is superbly clever the way that princess bride is so it was a little bit harder for me to buy into the fantasy sequences i don't know if that makes any sense no you're right it's not as it's not as it doesn't have that same writing technique to it the narration from old garth and walter uh do the talking for us i think we get to hear young hub a couple of times but other than that uh, not nothing really um i think that's something that does create that difference um, but you were talking about the writing and how it's not as superbly written, or at least, you know, Princess Bride, the great thing about that film is that the writing of those characters do use the classic fairy tale model, but in a way that's very creative and very um, witty, unique to William Goldman. But what this does, the strength in those sequences for me, at least is the emotion of what they're trying to convey. Um, and I think the writing in those sequences do kind of help that in that they're not, they're not the most detailed, they're not the best writing, uh, but the way that Walter, you were talking about point of view and how the Fred Savage character in Princess Bride perceives things. I think they did a similar thing here where um, Walter, Haley Joe Osmond's character, he's picturing this a bit broader. He's focusing more on the broad strokes um, and not so much in the details. The fact that they don't focus on those details, um, at least when we're told them, um, is because of the way Walter is seeing these stories, is imagining these stories. Because, you know, Garth, Garth he's describing these to him, um, but he's not telling them specific things about locations, the way they look. I think that's up to his imagination. And you know, when we first flash into the the, the fantasy sequences, we we um, fade out on Walter. So I think that uh, I think that also tells us that this is from his point of view of what he's seeing. I don't know if that makes any sense. I know that was kind of a long thread. No, 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 no. That makes absolute sense. You're right in that. A lot of times when uh, it's Garth telling the story, it will show a shot of Walter, and then it'll fade from his a shot of him like a close-up of him to the fantasy sequences. And that is a very clear way of telling you that it's supposed to be in his mind. Um, the, I guess you, you keep talking about like, and the movie keeps talking about what is the truth that's being told as, as, as opposed to the flowery way that it's telling it. One of the things, and sorry to keep comparing it to Princess Bride, but one of the things that I struggled with with Princess Bride before I finally settled on why it, it's such a classic is I always thought of the fantasy sequences, despite the wit, they look cheap, like the backgrounds. You can tell that the rocks are, are fake. You can tell that it's like matte paintings in the background. But the thing that I finally settled on after a number of years is that that's the boy, how he's imagining it. That's his imagination. So watching the movies and watching the TV shows or playing the video games that he plays, that is his perspective. And that's why that works. I think what this movie does in the same vein is that it keeps coming back to that idea of what is the truth that you're accepting here? Is it the silliness or the amateurishness of the way that the fantasy sequences are shot? Or is it about like, what is the point? Like, is, are you supposed to focus on why hub is so, you know, in love with the princess, you know what I mean? Is is that what you're supposed to focus on versus the flowery stuff? I mean, that the film does it at least um, the, to focus on really like we're supposed to focus on the grandness of it all, at least from his perspective. And I think one of the reasons that lead me to that conclusion is when we actually talk to Hub, when Walter actually talks to Hub about what really happened is the way he tells it. He doesn't tell it in a way that is very much your relative telling it to a, um, I guess they're a great uncle, so your your grandson or grand nephew or, or or something like that. But it it's very much hey, I'm telling it to you straight. I'm not mincing words here. I'm not adding this flamboyant 
ness to it or trying to distract you with the look we're sword fighting or look we're you know we're saving the princess from danger um they're trying to do it such that uh we're trying to disprove that point of view that way of thinking that this is not that the way you necessarily envisioned it was not how it was it was much harsher and you know when he tells them like this the film too is like if you want to find out the end of the story, you're going to have to ask him. So you expect that this, this, this story that we've been think, that we've been told throughout the film is going to have some great big conclusion. And when he says she died in childbirth and after that, I, I became lost. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I went back to the only thing that I knew, fought in the wars and then came here. It just doesn't matter the details of fantasy that the that the more flashy elements, or at least the flashy elements that they are, for as limited as, as they are, I'm not going to lie. The effects that they do have are on the on the cheaper side, but they they don't bother me so much because again, the the not only the intent of trying to use those effects and the way that these sequences are being told, but the way that the director is trying to show them that they don't matter so much as the finer details of, of the point of what he's yes, this is how Walter is imagining things, but that's not what matters. What matters is what Hub is trying to, and Garth is trying to get across. Yeah. Um, something that all, that it could also be because, you know, this is McCanley's second movie. I think he made a, a first film, Dancer, Texas Population 80 something. I can't remember the name of it, but that was, this is his second feature versus, you know, as opposed to Rob Reiner have been directed, you know, several movies before Princess Bride. It might have to do with, you know, studio backing or just his um, inexperience as a director. Um, Because, again, this is kind of, you know, being handed this as your directorial, like for a major studio, um, having this be the movie that you get to start with. Obviously, there's going to be some rough edges, I guess you could say, that he's not as, as confident as Rob Reiner. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. I mean, he wrote this in 93, I believe, and he had to fight to not only get it made, but to make sure he was going to be able to direct it too. And I think that's really important to something that we'll touch on later as far as like remakes and and things go, uh, uh, other adaptations. But I think that when they got to do the green light, it was also that feeling of, yes, how are we going to do this? I'm not familiar with it because they this was around when Lord of the Rings came out. And so when they got to New Line, they had been in the midst of making those movies. And so I think it may be a case of, of having the means, but not necessarily the the idea of trying to use that special effects in a way that people notice how well they are. Um, or it could have been, you know, as I've been saying, like, hey, this is nice. All the, the bells and whistles that you got. I don't know, like a 50 million away from, with some good effects as is, but I think if they really wanted to, they could have done more, but I, I'm, I think they didn't do more in, on purpose to make sure that people focused on what they were really trying to get at and not trying to be distracted by all the shock and awe as it were, of how things are presented in the fantasy world. Yeah, I think one of the things that I noticed watching the movie is there, there wasn't, didn't seem to be a lot of tension or there, there wasn't a lot of like, it just seemed like a very airy, like again, a gentle, gentle movie. The, the only part that got really tense was when uh, May comes with uh, the, the new boyfriend or whatever uh, played by Nikki cat. And, you know, they, they have the whole thing where there, it gets, a, it keeps getting darker and darker. Like how serious, how far is this guy going to go to find where the money is? And it comes down to, you know, because we've been jerked around, like, Walter finds the money in the basement and, and you know, after he has that heart to heart with hub about, you need to be my uncle and you need to stay with me. So I can, you can give me that speech later. You think they have a connection, but then they throw you, uh, they, you know, they, they throw you around a corner because then he finds the money in the basement. And then the thing with the mother comes in. And so it's like, wh- what is Walter supposed to believe? But I do like that. It comes down to, you know, when the, the boyfriend is, is pulling him away um uh, and you know he's talking about you know you, you're going to tell me where the the money is and uh you know he's he's yeah he's, he's taking them all by himself um but then you know walter starts thinking as he's talking uh uh stan is the boyfriend's name 
he's thinking as, as Stan's trying, yeah, they're, they're bank robbers and stuff like that. But then Walter thinks, but he, they couldn't have done all those things because they were in Africa. And he chooses at that moment to believe in his uncle's stories, even though they're not all true. He chooses to believe in them as people versus what the boyfriend and the mom and, you know, the salesman that they're shooting at or the other family that comes in. Um, we've been, the, the other perspectives are telling us that Hub and Garth are kind of not what they seem, but then Walter is able to see them and feel them for who they are, that it doesn't matter what they've done in the past. He knows who they are now, and that's what he tr chooses to believe in. Um, so even though it was relatively airless, I like that that did bring it in. What did you think? The other note that I wrote down here is this is a, a wish fulfillment movie because Walter shows up and he doesn't really have, it doesn't take a lot of scenes for, to break down the uncle's, you know, walls before they finally start trusting him. So that was pretty easy. You know, they get the, the lion that turns out to be defective that he can just have as a pet. And then the, they just have the corn that magically, you know, that I guess it takes a few months, but it seems to go like over a couple of days that the lion is able to disappear into. And again, that ties into Stan when he's beating up Walter, the lion comes out and, and, you know, rescues Walter from being hurt or the scene where hub in the uh, barbecue joint, the four greasers or whatever come in and, and try to start, uh, you know, some trouble and hub is a easily able to, to beat them up. You know what I mean? But then he takes them back to his farm, puts some meat on their eyes, invites them for dinner, gives them the, whatever young man should know speech. It just seemed, and that's, that's what I liked about the movie is it, it was very likable. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. It everything really came easy besides that part with with Stan uh, and the lion at the end. But do you think that is that something that you that you like about the movie? Is that something that appeals to you about the movie and and made it mean something to you that the the kind of easiness of the plot is that something that's attracted to you? Out of it in a different way. That's an interesting way of looking at it. But the way I perceived it is that. They, the, the bar fights and the, you know, shooting fish out of the pond and trying to grow, you, you know, crop, but it only turns out to be corn and the whole idea of like trying to shoot a lion for sport only to find out it's effective. Yeah, it is very well fish fulfillment now that you bring it up. Right from the start that they meet the kid, it's like, like you know, worldly, we've got to cook for himself, we've got to look after himself. And then we, so if we kick off in the middle of the night, you're on your own, you know, they're very honest brutally honest with them up front. So I think that's something that endears us to them early on, um, of how honest they are. Um, and then when you, these warmer scenes where they're being more interactive with them, you know, they're beating up the thugs. I think film trying to have those same, you know, adventure fantasy elements that those other fantasy sequences have, but it always ends on something real. You know, they fight the guys and then what? They drive them home, they, they patch them up and then Hub gives a speech to them. We don't hear until Walter hears it. Um, something like that always happens. You know, when they, they buy the lion, you know, they're expecting, you know, here we go. They're, here comes the, the scene that they're going to hunt the lion for sport and it turns out to be effective. You know, which is very real. Sometimes we, you know, we expect something from a product and we don't find it up to snuff um, or again like something like the crop you know we're expecting them to grow vegetables and they're going to eat well and turns out they got ripped off by the salesman and got all corn seeds you know something like that very real i think that that kind of matches well with what the film is trying to say like hey we can entertain you and be very wish fulfillment the world is going to end on something real and that's going to make the previous scenes a lot more meaningful at least like see how they fit within the, of the tonality of the film, the direction of where it's headed. Um, we can believe that we're seeing it through Walter's point of view and believe that it's maybe a little too, um, too uh, hyper fantasized about maybe he didn't actually beat up all those dudes in the bar. Um, but I think what endears us to that moment and those other moments like it is the way that they're presented very honestly at first. I like to think that there was something more to it there, that maybe the point was not to, not the bar fight, but what follows the bar fight, not 
getting the lion, but what happens after they get the lion, not planting the crop, but what happens after they plant the crop. So again, it's, it's more of not so much what they're doing as much as what they learn from it. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like they're entertaining enough. And, uh, I think the way, especially that Robert Duvall acts in the bar fight, you know, where he takes that guy by the, the neck and tells him, hey, I've fought in this many wars, killed many men, loved only one woman. I think that is very much his perspective. Or maybe, who knows, maybe that's actually how it is. And I mean, after all, we're seeing him break out of the hospital, you know, earlier, um, you know, refusing to take any care from these uh, nurses and just walking out of the hospital. Um, so maybe there, there is a hint of fantasy to it, but I like to think that they're real. They're playing, playing out um, in, in, in these ways that are, are viable, but they are very wish fulfillment. So I think Roger Ebert said it best in his review and that this film tells the story of a summer that every kid wished they had had no kid really had, um, but that they always, both before and after, it's actually how it is, just a heightened version of it. Maybe they, they contrast the fantasy sequences of, of Hub and Garb's adventures with the adventures that they're having now, compare and contrast to say, hey, both are, are, height, are uh, maybe exaggerations, but maybe one may be more truthful than the other. Who knows? Yeah, I, I, I think they leave that ambiguous. Yeah, they do. I think, you know, you mentioned the part about when he grabs the uh, the tough by the throat. He, I think Hub absolutely means that. You know, he talks about like, you know, I've fought in this many wars. I've killed this many people. I've loved one woman. It's that, those moments of seriousness are what I really bought the most, more than the fantasy sequences, because there's a truth to it. There's a truth to the way Duval is able to play it. There's a truth to the way you can tell uh, Kane is, you know, the way he admires his brother, that kind of thing. Um, and that's something that's the thing that I enjoyed most about the movie, though, were those sequences. But that chemistry between Robert Duvall and Michael Caine, I really bought into that. I liked, they had a warmth to them. And they really came off as familial. And they really came off as uh, loving to each other. What did... Um, and so that's something that I wouldn't uh, abs absolutely would not uh, uh, trade for anything. But what do you think of Haley Joel Osment as uh, as an actor? I know that he's six cents. He started a uh, pretty strong, actually, you know, as his first major role. And I mentioned in a previous episode that I, uh, my friend uh, Brian, when he saw the Sixth Sense for the first time on video, and I asked him what he thought of the acting, his his response was he thought about it and goes, you know, I I think there's a lot of power in whispering your lines which is what Haley Joel Osment does all the way through the sixth sense which is why you walk out of that movie thinking this kid's gonna go somewhere but other than you know pay it forward and um AI artificial intelligence and then with this movie because I think with secondhand lines he officially enters his gawky teenager stage where what is he gonna do now where he's not the cute kid he was before but what do you think about Haley Joel Osment as an actor in this movie and as an actor in, in general? So unfortunately I'm not familiar, have a full informed opinion of the actor, but as for hey, he, he's at in life, the time to the character of Walter, as far as like, you believe that he's still a kid, even though he looks like he's on the verge of adulthood and is on the verge of adulthood. I think the age of the character very much is, is very much important to this character and that's, as he's learning to become an adult, um, he's starting to discern reality from fantasy a lot more. And so he's starting to exercise that fantasy towards the beginning of the film when he's hearing these stories. Um, but the entire, you know, after he has a conversation with Hub, as you pointed out, everything else is pretty much portrayed as very uh, honest and intense and upfront, you know, almost too brutal. Clear and upfront. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, with, with um, his, especially his acting, it was a hard, it was hard for me at the beginning because, you know, what you said that you don't have a lot of connection to him, which is fine. Um, you're still, there's still time, obviously, to watch him and know these other things. Just reaching this gawky teenager stage, I thought watching his performance, like he oversold some of his lines at the beginning, you know, and he's sitting on the porch of them at first. He goes, if my mom calls, can we, and then we don't have a phone. He's like, you don't have a phone? And then he goes, well, can I go in and watch TV? And like, we don't have a TV. And then he goes, you don't have a TV? Like, what do you, what do you do? I think he maybe, 
he I get what he was going for. Like, obviously, he's a teenager and he's awkward and they call him a weenie, you know, that kind of thing. But I think he kind of maybe oversold those first few lines as far as trying to be a teenager. And there are times, you know, especially when he's talking with Hub about the you need to be my uncle. Some of his acting wasn't, you know, you're going up against Robert Duvall and there's obviously a... um, a dichotomy or a different, a difference in their acting abilities, because like you said, Duvall is very honest. And then Osmond kind of looks like he's acting like it looks like he's acting as opposed to just to being honest. But then over the course of the movie, he becomes less of, well, he's overselling that point to the point where he, you know, he has that conversation with his mom and then he walks back to the farm and he's in his, like his, uh, his sport jacket and he's talking to the uncles and he's got his hands on his hips, you know, under the suit. And he's telling him, you know, no more, not so much meat. You need to eat more veggies. He's telling basically how they need to live. There's a difference in the performance at the beginning versus the performance at the end. And I think when you read that McCanley shot the movie in sequence, because Osmond, I think, was going through puberty at the time, um, they shot it in sequence. So you can tell that his voice is squeaky at the beginning, but then it's more adult and more manly at the end. But that also, it might also have to do with, you know, spending time with Robert Duvall and Michael Caine. You see him grow as an actor over the course of the movie. So he becomes more natural by the end. Does that make sense? what uh, I mean do you did you see any of that that makes sense because a story where it's very much a boy learning to become a man discerning of the world around him you want something like that when you have a kid at the center of that to play things in sequence so at least in my mind I never questioned his acting I, I thought it was believable I think maybe yeah his early lines might have might have been might have seemed like he was acting but I think the moment that won me over was early on when he finds out that his mom is truly abandoned, abandoned him. That was very real. And especially when, you know, why aren't you headed to Fort Worth where your mom is? And she, she lied again. You know, the way that he says it, and he, you believe that this kid is, is, this isn't the first time that this has happened to him. And, and you can sense that, that this is something that is, heartbreaking for him without them having to explain that it's happened to him before. And that's true. You know, I think that's a bold pause yeah. again. And it, is, and it does the job perfectly in my opinion. Yeah. And like, like you said, that's very, very true. The, he, it's making me, again, you're making me rethink some things or again, uh, his performance is still going to be a little rough to me, but Growing up, um, again, I mentioned before, being an only child and having it just be me and my mom growing up there, you know, obviously she, my mom couldn't raise me to be like if I had a father around, I, I was a little bit, you know, how would you say like girly maybe growing up or a little bit odd or a little bit kind of, you know, standoffish or awkward because he doesn't, Walter doesn't have a good, you know, support system. Like his mom, like you said, is always lying to him and he's, kind of being raised by her, but kind of not. And so the awkwardness that he has is it comes from her. It comes from that upbringing. And so any awkwardness that Osmond gets across in his performance, that is part of his character. And, you know, thinking back on it, that even though some of the line readings might be a little rough, I absolutely do buy that as, um, as part of his character. You're right. Him talking on the phone and just the way that he's matter of fact about the way his mom lied to him. And he's just, realizing some things and coming to his own that's yeah that's that's very telling uh, and again i take that very personally yeah in my opinion at least as long as he you get the the main crucial character moments down um for me the rest of the performance is believable so that scene when he finds out the mother has abandoned him the scene in the shed when he discovers the mother the money and and that entire ending with Hub and Garth um, and the, once he does that very well, um, you, you buy these other moments where he, he admittedly doesn't have as much at a stake in because he's very much an observer, uh, a listener to these stories. He's not much of an active participant in those segments. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, okay. So I guess before maybe we move on um, to our, our final segment, talk about like how, how this movie stands up. You mentioned 
when we were talking before, um, when we were messaging, messaging each other on Twitter, you mentioned, and maybe we've talked about it, um, but maybe you could kind of put it in a, a more solid perspective. You talked about the right and the wrong way to make all age entertainment. And we've been kind of getting at that, but as far as secondhand lions goes, how do you think it does of, of make, does it, does it do it the right way? Does it do it the wrong way? How, how is its approach to making family entertainment? I, I feel like this is one of those family films that is a family film in, in every sense of the word. It's not a kid's film. It's, it's not kids only made for kids. Um, it's a family film that families can watch and enjoy together, but it doesn't have to be just one or the other. It can be for everyone. Everyone can make, get something from this that they will, they can take to the, take to heart, just even if it's one thing about the film, take that to heart and find some way to look at the world differently or look at themselves differently, much how I did. I was like, I was like eight, nine when I first saw this film. So I wasn't the youngest kid at the time, but I, I was at that age enough where I still wasn't thinking about the world and a much more gray area to how I see it now. Um, things are still black and white. And I remember the film shifting that perspective a bit. You know, I remember the first time when I saw, you know, The Incredibles and saw that film portrayed a version of reality that wasn't all fun and games. There is real truth. There is darkness to that film. That is important. It's not darkness for darkness sake, but it's very much a film that you know, doesn't talk down to kids at all, much like how this film doesn't talk, talk down to kids. Um, I find a lot of meaning from that. And whenever I see a film, one of those rare films that does come out, that does tell kids how it is sometimes, um, I appreciate more and more, um, certainly. Okay. And that, maybe that sums it up. I mean, as far as, you know, what we really come down to um, at the end of every um, uh this meat of you know the meat of our discussion talking about the movie what we come down to at the end of that is whether this is a movie that is worth um you know somebody taking another crack at it say taking another uh, stab at the material maybe doing a better job or and whether that would be something that we'd be welcome to or if it's a movie that needs to stay the way it is and then if somebody tried to remake it that that would be like an aberration and kind of an insult to what had been done so i guess maybe you kind of summed it up but if again if you want to maybe um uh, do your like capsule review of it do you think this movie do you think secondhand lions from 2003 is this movie worth remembering and worth keeping or is this worth a remake worth redoing again i think this is worth remembering honestly i can't imagine I looked it up. Apparently they turned this movie into a musical, which I find very odd. Uh, like in like 2013, 10 years after the film came out, they made this into a musical. I found that out today. I have no idea that was the case. So I'd be, I'd be interested in seeing what they did with that. But as far as like taking another stat of material, not only does I, do I feel like this film does it well, um, but I think that the personal origins from which this film sprung from, um, there's no way you can recreate that. I think if you were to do something similar to what this film does, you'd have to create a different story. You can follow a similar approach in terms of how it portrays its content and talks down. It doesn't talk down to kids. It tells it how it is. You can have another film like that, but you can't have it be a straight remake of like, you know, kid goes down to his two great uncles to spend a summer and it gets caught up in worlds of truth and gray area that the kid then has to decide for himself where his loyalties lie, what he believes in. Um, I think you'd have to try something different. You can try other weighty subject matter. I welcome it. Um, but I would think that you'd have to do something that the filmmaker, he, either he or she um, has a personal connection to because when you have that personal connection, it absolutely makes a difference. You can't make something to imitate someone else's point of view. You have to make something that is entirely truthful to your point of view. Otherwise there's that disconnect between you, the material and the audience material. Um, you have to have something in there that you connect with. Otherwise, if you don't believe in it, you're not going to make something that audiences are going to believe in. Yeah. 
Very good point. I mean, that's definitely, you're, you're taking it, uh, you know, you said that it's more of a personal perspective and that's what you need from movies. Not every movie is going to be for everybody. I think that's the thing that we need to really think about. I mean, if I were to, to come down to my decision to, yeah, there, there are things you can redo. You can punch up the, the dialogue, make it a little more witty. You could punch up like the fantasy sequences, make them a little more pretty. You could like tighten the story up, maybe have, you know, like we talked about Haley Joel Osment, it's not a terrible actor, but maybe have somebody that could sell it from the very beginning is uh, instead of making you think, well, is he trying to act or is that just something? Because like we said, Duvall and Kane are very honest in what they do. And Osmond has to work a little harder at it. Again, you could, all these little fixes that you could take, but there is that personal bent to it. There is, there wasn't, I, I've sat through movies before where I was checking the time every five minutes and this was not one of those movies. I talked about how it was a wish fulfillment movie, but I like that every now and then I don't need to yeah. be dark and cynical. I like that he got along with his, I like that there's, it's fun. You know, when they start getting along, it's fun. Watch. It's a very entertaining movie. And yeah, it's silly that the lion comes out from, you know, the corn and is able to save, you know, Walter from, from Stan and that kind of thing. But it's, I don't know. I think it works. I think it's honest about it's, it's schmaltziness. And like we talked about whimsy is not for everybody and there are better ways to do it, but I don't think you can pass up on Michael Caine and Robert Duvall together. I think they're very warm and, and, and fun to watch. And you can see, like we talked about Osmond grow as an actor and it's those moments that of truth that really hit hardest and really sell it more than the fantasy sequences to it. So I will also say it's worth remembering. It's, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it doesn't have to be as long as it, you know, McCamley's is making it for him, but he's also making it for a specific person. That's not everybody. It's not, not all movies are universal, and that's fine, I think. Yeah, and also you'd have to have a situation where if more people were to check this one out. Um, you'd have to have a different mindset. I think the way that movie going is today, if you had a film, if this came out today, I, don't, I think it would have done worse, honestly, than it did back in 2003. Um, because we're at a point now where not only are we used getting content faster and faster and so we're thinking less and less about the material and what we're seeing and what it actually means um but we're at a point where it's like family films that we're seeing today um play to a very specific formula of like we're going to have like over the top humor or maybe crass jokes here and there you know to appeal to adults and you, you know that's fine but the way that this film is constructed, at least, you have a film that um, appeals to adults in a more meaningful, deeper sense. And so I think there has to be a little changing of perspective there when it comes to different audiences. You'd have to be, accustomed, be more open and be more accustomed to a different way of seeing the film. Yeah. Which I know that probably sounds pretentious but yeah it's the best way i can say it at least yeah well you know uh, you say pretentious but i don't think it's that at all i mean again i really appreciate you coming on and, and chatting about this with me because like i keep saying over and over again someone that at your age again i sound like an old uh, get off my lawn type but someone <laughs> as young as you like being able to have this analytical mind and being able to look at things and process things differently that most, you know, 30, 40 year olds can't even do. They, they can't put that much thought. Again, I, I really think that gets across in your writing. I think that gets across in the way that you speak. And I think you've got a bright, a long, bright future ahead of you. And I, again, I appreciate you coming on with this. this you've made me rethink things. Again, I was kind of more on the downside, the negative side of the movie, but a lot of the things you talked about, about, you know, the, uh, the shots and the way that it's about truth and it's, it's what you take away from it versus what's presented to you and or how it's presented. You've made me rethink the movie in a way. And that's the kind of conversation that I live for, uh, especially in today's day and age. So again, I want to thank you for being able to come on and, and enlighten me in that way. But uh, as, as far as you go, again, if you want to tell us like, actually, let me ask you before we talk about your website, you getting an, and uh, writing for LDS living and getting that opportunity. If, if somebody else wants to do that, if somebody else that you're, that's your age or somebody that, you know, even a little older wants to be able to do what you're doing and kind of get their foot in the door, how would you 
what advice would you give like an aspiring critic as far as how to get yourself out there and make yourself known? So my advice to them were to be, um, you definitely have to put in effort, but if you're just starting, just start, just take that leap, take that jump, even though you may not that you you've set for yourself. Trust me, you'll get there. Even I don't think I've gotten there yet. I feel like I, I still haven't got it yet. I'm still adapting, growing, and I'm changing perspectives on everything. And, and that's okay. You're, you're really ne- always going to have something to learn and something to have to take to heart. So, yeah, I, just, just take the leap. Just go for it. Um, I didn't have everything down the first time I wrote my first review. And again, you'll look back and maybe you'll, you'll get queasy at the thought that you ever wrote that um, but I think that's important. That's still important is that you go and take that first step. You know, I can't read that now that I, now that I'm older and now that I'm at that point, but I'm proud of taking that step to begin with because, you know, I, I attribute that to everything that I'm doing now. Yes. Take that first leap, but be open to any and all criticism. You know, we live in a cynical world and it can be very hard sometimes, but you know, I think people need more new voices, regardless of who you are and what your life experience is. You'll always have something valuable to say and to share and to contribute to the world. As long as you don't let that, let the fear of no one will accept your opinion get you down, you're going to, you're going to be set. You're going to take that first leap and you're going to go places. Okay. I appreciate that. That's, that's, that's great advice for everybody. And again, your perspective is, is something that should be valued. So if, um, if tell us like where we can find you, like where can we find your writing and where can we uh, like reach you on Twitter and how can, how can we, uh, you know, obviously I want people to start following you and be able to, to learn from you. Cause I think that's important. Where can we find your writing and, and your presence online? Com. I was thinking about trying to shift to my own site, but uh, kind of going through a shift in life right now. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to be keeping that where it is for a while. Um, you can find me on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, I down some fanatic. I'm also on letterbox. If you have that, um, you can check out. Um, yeah, pretty much just check it out. You don't have to give me a follow. You don't have to even read it, but uh, if you're open to reading reviews or reading different, different points of view. Uh, I think mine are different enough. I hope they're different enough. I, I don't read many reviews nowadays as I would like to, but on the occasion that I do write something, I'm always excited to hear what another person has on client. Um, always help to hear another point of view on things. So um, yeah, you check me out there. Um, it's the Tron Legacy icon. So if there happens to be another down the film fanatic out there, um, no, that's me. Okay, so uh, you said DallonTheFilmFanatic.com, right? No dashes or anything in there? Uh, no, just stoplockspot.com. Okay, sounds great. So again, Dallon, I want to thank you for coming on and, and talking secondhand lines with me. This is, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm not trying to give you a swelled head, but this has been a very enriching conversation. Um, you don't expect to find that in somebody half my age. <laughs> so I appreciate you. Oh, man. Uh, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Don't write as much. Thank you for having me on the show and go randomly get this guy follow. He's got a lot of great material. He's got a lot of great stuff. Okay. All right. Appreciate you. Thanks for the conversation, Dallin. You have a good night. You too. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, and again, we want to thank Dallin, the film fanatic, for joining us. Um, again, very good conversation that we had with him. We obviously gave our opinions on Secondhand Lions as far as uh, worth remembering or worth a remake. But uh, you catching up with it, where where do you fall on that on that side of the fence for the movie? Well, it's interesting because having watched it again recently, um, and like I mentioned earlier, it was a movie that I wasn't really that fond of. I saw it, but it was forgettable for me. I didn't really have any like connection to it. It was just kind of like, okay, that, that was fine. That was whatever. Um, but watching it again, I was, I was more into it. I, I liked it more. I can say I liked the characters more. Um, and I, I liked just watching the progression of the characters and everything. And um, so I, I could say it was worth remembering for that reason. Um, but still, it still isn't something that I would like run out to buy or run out to watch or, you know, you know, it's just something that is still kind of forgettable, even though I think it's worth remembering because it's, it is a decent movie. You yeah. know what I'm saying? 
So what do you think was the difference between watching it before versus watching it now? I don't know. Maybe I'm just because I'm, I'm older. Um, I, I can relate to those characters a little more, I guess. Uh, I saw it when I was probably, I don't know when it came out, 2001? 2001, 2003, 2001? yeah, yeah. So I guess I was in uh, college, I guess. So I don't know. I was just, I guess I was just into other things back then. It wasn't the kind of movie that I really wanted to watch. And so, like I say, it was forgettable for me. But um, it was still pretty good. It wasn't bad. Okay. But I think, I think I'm, just, uh, I'm older and I think uh, I can appreciate it more. Okay. Just a different mindset then versus now, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, obviously one of the big things about the movie was talking Haley Joel Osment. I know we've mentioned him before. I know that he hit it pretty big with Sixth Sense, even though he made an impression in Forrest Gump, things like that. And, you know, hitting his awkward teen years um, and watching him kind of, you know, I don't know if he's ever matched the intensity of playing Cole in the Sixth Sense. Um, uh, sometimes kid actors, they're good. Um, what was the kid from Jerry Maguire, Jonathan Lipnicki? I mean, he's really good in Jerry Maguire, but I don't know. He's just, you have a hard time finding a niche or finding your place or, or finding your identity after, you know, you start growing up. I, uh, as far as Halo Joel Osment goes, I don't know if he, like I said, I don't know if he is as strong as he was coming out of the bat. So something that we want maybe want to talk about for our outro topic is kid actors. I mean, like we, like I mentioned, sometimes they kind of disappear because they can't find the roles that they need, or they don't mature fully into the better, stronger actors. But if we wanted to talk, maybe some kid actors that we knew from when they were kids who kind of have grown into you know, very strong, capable, uh, you know, award-worthy actors. How about that? Sure, that sounds good. Okay. So we each, uh, you know, obviously we keep texting each other just to have ideas. So we each had, uh, you know, three uh, three people we kind of want to mention, some briefly, some not so briefly. Okay. So who is the first kid actor that you kind of wanted to, to chat about? Well, the first one I thought of was uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And mm. um, I say that because... He, I think he's always been good. Maybe, I mean, he's obviously better now. He's kind of like honed his craft. He's a really good actor. But um, in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, I thought he was amazing. Like, I thought he was, he was great in that role. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that he was acting <laughs> when I first saw it. I thought, did they really get, like, a handicapped person to play this part? Yeah. He was, he was that good. Um, but, I mean, over the years, he's definitely done some really outstanding work, you know, especially recently with, like, Tarantino. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought of him, you know, he has the baby face, right? So being in this boy's life or Gilbert Grape or Romeo and Juliet, he, yeah. or even, I don't know, even the aviator, I kind of felt he was miscast. I don't know if he has the same, like you said, he was great in Gilbert Grape, but that baby face kind of worked against him a lot of the time. So I didn't really see him, you know, being Howard Hughes. Um, it, it was kind of maybe too mature for his baby face. I don't know if it worked a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned this boy's life, but that's another one that I think there was a progression there. Like you could tell he was going somewhere because I thought yeah, he was yeah. great in that movie too. Um, but then there were movies like, what's that one called? The Beach. Yeah. And then other ones that like uh, the Martin Scorsese one, not Departed, but the other one. The Aviator. He did that one. The other one. Isn't there one other one he did? With uh, him? Shutter Island, right? Yeah. That one. That one. Yeah. I mean, those are kind of forgettable movies, but uh, he was still, you know, decent in those roles. But like I say, over the years, he's really gotten, he's really gotten yeah. good. And like, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that he's not good. I just think that like the baby face kind of worked against him. I think the first movie that I watched him in that I thought, oh, he's a leading man now. I thought that was, I really liked him in Inception because I don't know what it was, like the role he was doing or that he was holding a gun uh, or just the, the gravitas that he had and like the, you know, the story with his wife and it just kind of made him more emotional and grounded, even though it's not a very grounded movie. I just thought watching that, I was like, oh, this guy's a man now. So ever since then, I've thought he's been, he's grown out of that baby phase. Um, mm -hmm. But I do agree with you. It's like, uh, you know, he was gifted from the beginning. So going along with that, the first person I want to mention, we've talked about him before, was Christian Bale. Um, mm -hmm. I know showing up in Empire of the Sun, which is probably Spielberg's most underrated masterwork, I would say. It's a movie that I didn't like as a kid. I know that one of our friends, Mike, he really loved Empire of the Sun, and it was a movie that I just thought of as very pretty, but not, not much else. But then when you watch it again as an adult and you realize that what Spielberg was doing with that movie is it's so 
grandiose and everything's so over the top because again it's a 13 14 year old that's imagining that's seeing this world so he's misinterpreting a lot of the tragedies as being something more than that and so that's what really helps that movie but again christian bell right out of the gate one of the strongest child performances and we've talked about that with spielberg too just how he's able to pull these performances because he's a little bit of a kid himself out of these kid actors and make them believable in in ways that a lot of kid actors aren't because they don't have that range i think spielberg is able to pull that out of him but then christian yeah. bale we talked about him in swing kids and newsies and you know he was fine in those but now that he's done american psycho and um uh the machinist <laughs> batman obviously so he's uh american hustle um Vice, you know, all these movies. He's a great actor that's willing to go places that a lot of actors aren't willing to go. So it's exciting watching what he will do. And again, that's a sign of a good actor that you can play Batman for three movies and then not still have a career after that. Um, so Christian Bale is just one, somebody that I've always admired. Who was a, a second person you wanted to chat about? Well, I thought about another one who I thought was good from the beginning and that's Drew Barrymore. Hmm. You know, from, yeah, I thought she was great in E.T., and she's a really good child actor. And she had a career. She did kind of fall off the map for a while with her, you know, her drug issues and her, you know, partying and all kind of stuff. But she came back. And uh, when she came back, she came back with those, you know, Adam Sandler movies like, you know, um, The Wedding Singer, which I think she's adorable in. She's really cute. Yeah. And um, and then what's the other ones? There's um, Blended. What's the other ones that she's done with Adam Sandler? Uh, Blended was one. Whoa, my screen just went white. Uh, Blended was one that she did. Um, what was the one? The amnesia one what's the amnesia? Uh, 50 first dates ah sorry my screen is slipping out yeah the biggest movies but you know she's she's good in those movies and i think that you know her and adam Sandler do have a chemistry on screen and i know they're really good friends yeah but yeah not that she's um not that i can say her her career has or her her acting prowess has gotten like much better she's always been good but um i like her in those movies okay um well again that's going back to spielberg just her being able to you know what was the episode we talked about? I think again, it was, when did we talk about kid actors? You remember that episode, what it was? I don't, it might've been, uh, oh, I don't remember what it was. We're getting so old. Our memories are just disappearing on us. <laughs> but I do remember we talked specifically about um, Spielberg and the way that he directed her in um, uh, uh, E.T., just the way he was able to tell her, not tell her how to act like Chris Columbus tells the Harry Potter kids how to act, but basically tells her, I need you to cry he needed her to cry, but instead of just saying, I need you to cry or, you know, poking her in the arm really hard, he told her story, you know, I need you to imagine like losing a puppy or losing a friend. And as you're, as you're doing these lines, like just remember what that feels like. And he's able to pull a performance out of her, just yeah. not from telling what to do, but helping her feel it from, you know, internally. Um, I think yeah, stand, by me. stand by me. We <laughs> talked about, that's right. Kid actress. You know, we remember stuff. It just comes a little slower to us now. Um, but I think the funny thing about Drew Barrymore, again, she's great because she, again, independent. She's uh, had her own production company, I think Flower Film. She's had a, a career. Um, I just know that it, it's weird because when you put her in like a, a, a sexy role, like Charlie's Angels or something like that, I have a hard time with that because I still just see the little girl. And every now and then I'll hear her voice. And so it's kind of like you know, you can't be attracted to, you know, a little girl that you grew up with, you know, so it's, it always is like, well, yeah, she's great, but you know. She's our age too. I think she was born the same year we were born. Yeah, absolutely. But again, nothing taken away from performance. I just think it's funny that I always see that little kid in her. And uh, speaking of which, you know, Natalie Portman's another one who started out relatively early. I know people will remember her from The Phantom Menace, but I will always remember her from Leon the Professional, yeah. uh, the Luc Besson movie, where she played, I think, 12. Um, it's the girl beyond her age um, uh, with Jean Reno. But that's another thing. I know she's gone on, again, Annihilation or uh, Black Swan or, you know, all these movies that she, and she won an Oscar for Black Swan. So obviously she's a very good, uh, determined actress and she's trying to, you know, be, uh, you know, use her, uh, her, her womanhood, I guess you could say, to make a point and kind of push feminism and, and put uh, push women in the spotlight. But again, she's one of these actresses that it's like, I'll always see her as the 12-year-old from The Professional. So watching a movie like Black Swan was uncomfortable for me because it's like, this is like watching a little girl kind of indulge in things that like they, sh you know, she shouldn't be indulging in. And so it was an awkward movie for me because again, 
I just see her as the 12 year old and that's, she's always got that baby face for me. Yeah. Do you, do you think she, um, how do you feel about her as an actress? I think she's decent. I think she's good. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, she's very strong willed and, and makes, you know, tries to make a point and tries to use her celebrity for, for reason. And so that's, uh, that's to be admired. So you're a uh, third person to talk about. Well, I picked a couple people for this one and um, I did this because not because I think they're great actors or anything, but because I was surprised to see that they actually ended up with a career because when I, when I was younger, I saw a movie called airborne mm -hmm. and um, it's a skateboard movie uh, set in Cincinnati. And um, these two characters, these two side characters show up in the movie. I forget their names of characters, but it was played by Seth Green and Jack Black. Okay. And I remember thinking when I saw them on screen, like that guy's terrible and that guy's terrible and they will never have a career. <laughs> like, like, I don't know, years later, they started having his career. And I was like, what is going on here? Like, how is this possible? Um, I mean, they're, they're fine, I guess, but I, don't, I wouldn't say they're, you know, any kind of like, you know, amazing actors or anything. I just think it's funny that these people I thought were terrible that would never go anywhere actually went somewhere. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, you know, like you're talking about, like you said, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if they are like what we consider great actors, but it's hard for somebody to, you know, cause it's called acting, right? I know Seth Green and Jack Black, they have personas in real life that they're able to translate to the screen like a hundred percent, like intact, like how you see them in life is how they are on these shows like Seth Green and uh, Austin Powers or, you know, any TV show that he pops up in, he's Seth Green and he's, you like him and he's funny and he's snarky. And the same thing with Jack Black, whether he's playing a panda or whether he's in school of rock, that's yeah. obviously going to be Jack Black, but you like him for that. Yeah. Um, Tenacious D stuff like that. It's just, you, we kind of are negative towards actors who are kind of one note, but I always bring up Cary Grant, like Cary Grant wasn't the deepest, um, most versatile actor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Harrison Ford's not the most versatile actor, but we go to these movies to see the, you know, I want to go see Harrison Ford be Harrison Ford. That's something to admire. Um, so what, uh, do you have any favorite performances from them? If I had to pick a favorite performance, um, I'd probably pick, um, I don't know, Jack Black. I can't think of a one that I really like him in. I mean, I, he's, he's okay in some movies, but like, I do like Pick of Destiny because yeah. it has the music element. Right. Um, uh, but Seth Green, I, I don't know. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he pops up and you like him, though. I guess that's the thing, right? I would say I like him. <laughs> <laughs> Just that he's got a, a, a career after you thought it would go nowhere, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, I guess the last person that I want to talk about, and again, not um, the – Again, not one of the most versatile actors, but it's definitely a guy that I enjoy just listening to. It's, it's Jason Bateman. Um, mm -hmm. He started off, I know um, Justine Bateman on Family Ties. She was yeah. the star of that family and he guest starred on that. And um, what was the what was the movie that got him in the spotlight? Two, I think. Yeah, two, where it's just the exact same script, except he's a boxer instead of a basketball player. <laughs> Do you, let me ask you a question. I know that you talked about Michael J. Fox not being a great basketball player, especially when we talked mm -hmm. about him in the Frighter. How do you think Jason Bateman did as a boxer? Um, I don't know. I don't remember that movie too well. So <laughs> maybe he was okay. I don't know. I don't remember. Well, obviously it didn't stand out. I know that the Michael J. Fox thing, not being able to shoot a basket is something that's going to dog you for the rest of your life. <laughs> You'll always remember that. But, you know, being on Arrested Development, he's got he's gotten a voice and he's just really funny. And it's you expect a certain kind of sardonic kind of comedy from him and it's it's enjoyable and what um were there well, any recently, yeah recently he's done the uh, uh, zodiac right? not zodiac but uh, ozarks. ozarks the tv series right yeah, yeah. yeah which is really good uh, okay. if you haven't seen it it's really good it's really well done yeah i haven't been um, able to i know he he wrote a few episodes and he directs some of those episodes as well yeah so, uh, he's really good in that show and then I really like him recently in the movie Game Night. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> that movie just has, again, that fits his personality. It's got his humor in it. And, you know, everybody has the, the role that they play and it all works. Rachel McAdams plays off him really well. Yeah. Um, it's one of those scripts that I wish I had written. <laughs> yeah, just really funny and really well done and, and uh, clever and imaginative. But again, you know, Zootopia too. I mean, you, you just hear Jason Bateman's voice and it's just 
I don't know. It's like a glass of warm milk. It's just very comforting. And, you know, you know, you're going to have a fun time just looking at him, listening to him, just watching him too. He's one of those, I could watch him just, I could listen to him read, a, you know, names out of a phone book and he'd probably make it entertaining. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. So that, um, you know, we'd love to hear if anybody else uh, paying attention to our little podcast here, if anybody else has any child actors that they wanted to point out, if, if, you, you think that Haley Joel Osment has been, you know, a stronger actor now than he has before. If you want to talk about um, the Harry Potter kids, I know each of them have, have gone and kind of branched out. Um, Radcliffe and Watson, especially, I know, uh, know how to work their way around the spotlight. Um, mm-hmm. So if anybody wants to leave a comment or, or just write to us or anything like that, feel free to, to do that on our YouTube channel or on Twitter and let us know what you think. So again, that was, um, Speaking of secondhand lions and leading us down that rabbit hole of, you know, kid actors turned into great adult actors. I think we'll move on from that world onto our next episode. So our next uh, uh, guest we have is again, a, a great friend from Twitter, Lauren K. She has decided she wants to talk about a movie called wild hearts can't be broken. Okay. Um, do you have any memories of, of that movie? Yes. I saw that uh, a lot with my family growing up. So, yep. That's okay. Really is that, would you say it's a movie that, your sisters watched a lot. Is that something that you would always catch them watching? Yes, they watched it quite a bit. Okay. And that might explain why I've never seen it because I don't have any sisters. So I would have had no reason for that movie to be on. But again, nothing, I'm, I'm all about, the reason we want to have guests on is just so we can get somebody else's perspective. And so it, if that allows us to visit movies that we've never seen or, or allows us to revisit them in a light that we... Um, didn't view it or a lens that we didn't view it through before, then great. I'm all for that. I'd, I'd love to do that. So again, uh, Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken, directed by Steve Miner uh, and Gabrielle Anwar, Cliff Robertson, I believe is in that from 1991. Again, it's a, uh, what is it? A girl that uh, jumps a horse off a, off of a diving board. Off like a, that. Okay. So that'll be fun to at least visit and see uh, if it works for us or if it's going to be another, you know, labyrinth type episode where we have to go, okay. Lauren, we're going to have to sit back. We're going to have to let you explain this to us because we just didn't get it. <laughs> you know, we want to be able to, um, you know, have that kind of not derogatory conversation for movies that um, a lot of other people hold dear. Um, but, you know, being able to, to kind of meet in the middle and, and uh, see how we view different movies. So I think that'll be fun. So again, that's next time Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. Um, uh, but until then, again, for Nostalgia Cast, I'm Darren Lundberg. And I'm Johnny Craddock. And we'll see you next time, guys. Bye.